Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Get Cooking Freezer Meals. Um, my name is Beth. I'm a, the adult librarian uh, with uh, the community libraries, so Choctaw, Hera, Nakoma Park, Jones, and Luther. And uh, we're excited this evening to have uh, Taylor Connor from OSU Extension uh, to present this program for us. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors um, that provided the funding for this program, the Oklahoma Department of Libraries and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Um, we do have um, handouts and copies of the presentation that uh, will be sent out. We also um, would like to invite you to join us um, next month. Um, again, on the uh, third Tuesday, Taylor will be doing a program on smoothies as well. Um, at 6.30 again, you can register at uh, metrolibrary.org backslash events. And um, because this program is grant funded, we will also be emailing a link out to a survey at uh, the end of the program to participants. So we hope that you will fill it out and share your thoughts with us as that helps us um, to get funding for programs like this. Um, at this time, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that I can turn it over to Taylor if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on that. You can also um, raise your hand, um, which if you're looking at the participant box, um, it should let you do that. You should see a, a spot where it says um, at, towards the bottom, raise your hand. Um, and I will keep an eye on that as well and let Taylor know that we have uh, questions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Taylor. Alrighty, I'll go ahead and get situated. All my stuff in here, close out everything and we will get started. So as Beth said, my name is Taylor Connor. I work for Oklahoma County OSU Extension, so here in Oklahoma City, and I am a family and consumer sciences educator as well as a registered dietitian. So a lot of what I do is about food and nutrition. Um, I do a lot of food preservation, those types of things too. So like tonight, I'll be talking, of course, about freezer mills, which is a form of food preservation, but it is also, I'm going to also be tying in nutrition into it and how you can make healthier meals faster with freezer meals. And so it's not to sell you on a product, but to sell you on an idea so you can really be motivated to make healthier meals at home. The things that I will be covering tonight are the advantages of freezing. So why you should freeze at home. And another thing I wanna cover is how to create healthy freezer meal plans. So I'm gonna be breaking it down and how to give you a clear picture of how you can make not only healthier meals, but how to make freezer meals in an efficient time. I don't know if you guys can see this bar at the top, but it's kind of spazzing out on me. I'm gonna try and move this. Let me get out of this really quick. I apologize, technology, I guess, is just not wanting to work with us tonight. Okay, you guys can't see that bar or anything, right? I think that's just a Zoom thing. I'm still trying to figure this out. Okay, there you go. So another thing I will be talking about, going back to that last slide, is the best packaging method. So yes, there are certain items, certain ways that you should package your freezer meals so you can maximize the quality of your product. And then I'm gonna be talking about steps to efficiently prepare meals so you can minimize your time in the kitchen and um, maximize the benefits of freezer meals. And then following up with food safety, it's always good to touch on that because we wanna make sure that we are making smart choices when it comes to packaging food so we're not getting ourselves or our family members sick. So just about any food can be frozen, which is one of the greatest benefits of freezer meals. 
So despite freezing, foods can still retain a lot of their natural color, flavor, and nutritive value. And this is another great advantage of freezing at home. And in comparison to other food preservation methods, such as canning, whether you do pressure canning, your water bath canning, or dehydrating, it's going to typically take less time. And um, the, tip, the texture will also hold up better. And so that last line where it just states that, you know, it's gonna take less time. If you've ever canned at home, especially pressure canned, I mean, that's a great method of food preservation, but it takes at least a couple of hours, whereas you could prepare a whole meal, a whole week's worth of meals in an hour or so, once you get really efficient with your time. Okay. So some other advantages is that freezing meals at home is a simple procedure. It's straightforward. There's no extensive process. Pretty much the, the most you're typically going to do is you're going to cook your meal in some circumstances. Sometimes it's just a dump meal and you put it in a bag and you freeze it like the, food, the recipe I'll be demonstrating tonight. And other times you may need a blanch item. So if you're going to freeze vegetables in general, you usually need to blanch them, which is where you just put them in a hot water bath and then you put them in an ice bath right after. And what that does is that locks in um, those enzymes so they don't, um, so they don't um, ripen faster or ripen really at all. You're stopping that process. And then it really um, can be a convenience when you freeze, freeze meals at home, especially when you make larger meals. So if you ever made a large batch of something and you don't want to have it for leftovers the next night, all you simply have to do is throw it in a bag, throw it in a freezer safe container, and I'll talk more about that later. And then you just have it for a week later or maybe even a month later. And then um, another great way is when it going back into eating healthier is that it allows you to create better proportions. So you know how much you're gonna be eating and you can really, like in this picture, it shows these different containers. You can, if it's just you at home, it's a great time to plan your meals out. So you just take them out warm up and they're ready to go and you don't have to think about uh, worrying about overeating. You're, you're, you're in better control of those portion sizes. And then the, the last advantage and one that is of interest, I'm sure a lot of times, or recently, I feel like the temperature outside, I don't know about you, the temperature outside about a couple weeks ago, it was like 70 degrees and then two days later it was 90 degrees and I feel like ever since it's it's been like that. So you're going to um, actually have a cooler kitchen, which is gonna make you more comfortable. You know, when you go to heat up your meals, you simply turn on the oven or whatever, maybe it's a slow cooker, and then you can go and do the things that you need to and come back in the kitchen and it's ready. You're not busy working in the kitchen and getting exhausted. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna cover before we get into the packages and everything, I want to talk about how we can make meals healthier at home in general, but especially with freezer meals. And I will say it's not complicated. I feel like a lot of times we tend to overcomplicate eating healthy. We've got to follow the strict diet. We've got to eat these foods only. We can't eat these foods. And really it's not that complicated. If you think back to elementary, when you learned the food pyramid, now we call it my plate. We really, to eat healthy realistically, it's just to eat these five food groups three times a day. So we wanna eat five as much as we can for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I say breakfast, lunch, and dinner because that's gonna create consistent intake of calories so our body can have the energy to move. And so we start with our vegetables and our vegetables are, we know they're great for us, but why? They've got a lot of fiber, a lot of antioxidants which can reduce our chances of different types of cancers. They've got a lot of vitamin C and K as well as a lot of other ones. And, um, you know, I don't know if you ever heard the term, but it's really important when we're talking about vegetables as well as fruits, is that we want to eat a rainbow of fruits and vegetables, meaning we want to eat a different color as much as we can instead of eating the same vegetable every day. So if we like broccoli a lot, we ate it every day, we're just going to be getting those nutrients. But when we eat like a yellow bell pepper or a carrot, you know, all these different colors, they actually have different nutrient profiles. And we're going to be allowing our body to have a a wide variety of nutrients. Another good tip when we're talking about vegetables, and maybe you didn't know, but if you leave the peel or the skin on, you're actually going to be retaining a lot more nutrients. You're going to be retaining fiber. So in items like summer squash, um, I'm trying to think of other ones, potatoes, those ones that we typically peel, 
leave the skin on because that's going to add those benefits to it. Of course, there's some things like butternut squash. We're obviously not going to leave the skin on. And then when it comes to choosing what types of vegetables, well, I typically say fresh is best, but of course we're going to be freezing it if we're talking about freezer mills. And so what is a great convenience when you're freezing whole meals is if you already buy the frozen item. And I, one of the recipes that I provided for you guys is called butternut squash. And if you've ever worked with butternut squash, it's a pain. So if you can actually buy it nowadays, already diced in the freezer section. So those are still just as rich in nutrients as your fresh items. And then there's canned options, which you can choose to incorporate, like with the taco soup that I have for you guys, that I'm gonna prepare for you guys, is those are great options, but the thing you wanna pay attention to is the sodium. And I'll get more into that in a, a few minutes, but um, just be wary of the sodium content. And then we look at our next food group, which is grains. And grains are things that come from plants like wheat and um, oats, all those sorts of grains you just think of like what creates flour. And what we wanna focus on when we're talking about grains is we want to focus on whole grains, meaning it's got the whole, it's got all of the whole grain there. There's, if you didn't know, there's three layers to a grain. There's your bran, endosperm, and your germ. And all of those are full of a lot of nutrients, especially a lot more fiber and B vitamins like thiamine, riboflavin, folate. And so when you eat the whole grain, you're getting all that. But when you eat enriched grains, like think of white flour, it's just that white part it's the endosperm and you're losing those nutrients there. But when you choose whole grains, you're getting more fiber, which is really important, important for our digestive health. It's important if you have type two diabetes, maintaining your blood sugars or just diabetes in general. And it's great for cardiovascular health. And then moving on to proteins. A lot of times we just tend to think of meat, but there are a lot of alternatives than just meat. There are tofu, tofu tempeh, you've got legumes, which is simply a fancy word for beans or lentils and you can eat eggs, but really going back to that meat, if you, I know a lot of us like to eat meat, which is okay, but we want to make sure that we're not eating too much red meat and that when we're choosing meat, we eat the lean cuts of meat. So on here, I put choose lean cuts of meat, 95. The recipe that has the ground beef that I use for tonight has 93, that is a great percentage of lean. The reason why you want lean is because it's gonna have less fat. And when there's more fat in your proteins, then you're gonna have more calories. And um, it's harder on our arteries as well because it's higher in saturated fat. And that's not a good fat for our heart. So want, you want to simply just choose those leaner cuts of meat. All right, let's see if my computer can stop freaking out on me right now. Can you guys see the screen okay? Yeah. Okay. Apologize. My my screen, I guess, because I switched it back over, is kind of not working for me at the moment. But and following along, we're going to touch on dairy next. So dairy, we tend to think of just cow's milk. And cow's milk is a great source because what we're focusing on is we are focusing on our calcium and vitamin D intake. I wish my computer would stop. Technology is just not how I want to do this right now. And so there are a lot of options when it comes to dairy. It's not just cow's milk, there are soy milk. So if you're lactose intolerant, soy milk is full of a lot of calcium, a lot of vitamin C, it's, it's added to it, so you're hitting on those. But what you really want to focus on with dairy is just simply the calcium intake. So you can add in milk to your freezer meal items, you can add in yogurt. So if you're gonna have enchiladas, you can add a dollop of yogurt when you go to serve it. And that's one way, and I know Greek yogurt may sound kind of weird, but what it's a great alternative for sour cream, which is going to be higher in fat. Let me get back into this. Can you, is the screen freaking out on you guys too? It's not. You look, it looks good. Why does it have to be on my end? Okay, well, I guess I can just follow through on my notes. Okay, so. Then fruits. Fruits is kind of a weird one when we're talking about planning freezer meals because fruit doesn't really fit into our, our dinner meals, right? That's not something that we typically add in unless you can be really creative. So it's kind of a hard one that you have to be creative with where you want to try to maybe just simply add a cup of fruit on the side. You can also um, 
You can also uh, have it as a dessert if you'd like. That's a great way because the thing with fruits, just like going back to vegetables, is we want that variety of nutrients in our diet. And it doesn't have to be complicated. And so we can focus on fresh fruit, but we can also do frozen if it's convenient, as well as canned. And if you're going to choose like a fruit cocktail, a uh, word of advice, if you're looking down the grocery aisle at your canned fruit items, you want to look for canned fruit items that are packed in either water, it's natural juices or 100% fruit juice because well, the other alternative is that it's packed in some kind of heavy syrup, maybe light syrup, but either way, it's gonna be added calories, added sugar. So, I mean, it makes sense just to easily swap out those two different items. And then talked about the food, five food groups. So these are the five food groups that realistically you would like to get for each meal three times a day, right? But what about the foods that we shouldn't eat? Well, I think we are, pretty well aware of those bad items and I don't mean to be a food police and I definitely like a donut every once in a while, but we know that these items are not good for us if we eat them every day. And these are things like, like donuts, like chips, like soda, those foods that are high in salt, high in, high, high in added sugars. And if you're really worried about your added sugar intake, actually I think as of 2021, most or if not all companies that have a food label should have an added sugar line. So you can actually see where, how much added sugar is added to that. But this is not to say all sugar is bad. These are just sugars that are added into products, not naturally there. So your sugar that's in like your fruit, I mean, your fruit's full of so many other nutrients, your fiber, your other vitamins, your minerals. We know that those are good for us. So fruit is not bad for us, but it's more of the added sugar. And then moving on to the salty foods, those that are high in sodium. So salt, sodium, kind of similar. And we typically in our American diet get a lot of sodium, especially if you eat out a lot, there's a lot of sodium in your food. And if you have high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, I'm sure you've heard from your doctor, maybe a dietitian to watch the sodium in your diet because it really contributes to a lot of pressure on your arteries and your veins. So you want to um, watch how much sodium you're taking in. So like even the recipes I have tonight, they're great because they have that lower sodium option, which a lot of products are, or a lot of companies are starting to move towards nowadays. And then there's your, your fat content. So there's good fat and there's bad fat, right? We've got our good fat, which is unsaturated fat. And those are things that are like plant oils, like olive oil. And just because they're good, doesn't mean we should eat a lot of it or have it a lot in our dish. It's still high in calories, but it's not as hard on our heart. But things like saturated and trans fat are especially hard on our our arteries and that's what can contribute to a lot of cardiovascular disease and other heart issues. So you want to look on your products whenever you're at the grocery store and you're comparing, you want to look for those that have the less amount of grams per the serving size. So you always gotta compare serving sizes too. Um, so just be wary. A lot of products don't have trans fat nowadays anyway. Okay, let me get out of this and pull up my picture. Now you guys should see a handout I have. I hope you can see that. I wish my computer would stop. And if you can't, just let me know because I can't really see much on there right now. But what you will see is I have created for you guys and hopefully you can use it and find it useful at home, a, an example plan. So if you wanna just go for it and create it, great. But I, I will, advice and that's one of the biggest things if you're coming here to this presentation thinking oh i'm gonna just start making meals seven days a week freeze your meal seven days a week well i will tell you that's not a realistic thing to do because you'll find out really fast that you'll be in the kitchen for five hours preparing one day for whole for a whole week so i challenge you if you're going to do this if you're really going to get into making freezer meals to start out with one day or maybe two days whatever is comfortable but don't overwhelm yourself because then you probably won't want to do it ever again because you'll be traumatized. So I have this seven day plan and going through the different recipes. The first one is the butternut squash and I don't think I'm on that page. Let me go back here. Okay, whatever. Okay, we're gonna assume I'm on the butternut squash because I can't tell. So this is my favorite recipe if you really wanna be creative in incorporating some different type of vegetable this butternut squash lasagna recipe is great. And it does take a little bit more work if you're going to do it from a raw butternut squash you bought from the store. But this is going back to the freezer 
mill items. You can really save time when you purchase those, those items that are already frozen that you could just toss together. And I wanted to go through this list. Let me try to pull this up again. Maybe I can pull this up. Okay, nope, it's not gonna work for me. Nope, nope. Okay, I wanted to go through the list, but I don't think that's gonna work. Um, but if you have it, if you guys can see it okay, or you have it printed out, I wanted to just point out how easy it can be to make freezer meals at home that are healthy. So the, for instance, a butternut squash recipe, when you're looking at it, you see that your vegetable is a butternut squash. So we've got that covered. And then we move on down and we see that there's milk. That's your dairy serving. And with milk, you want to try to choose low fat or fat free options. I'm not saying you have to switch to skim milk because I don't even personally like skim milk. But if you've ever compared whole milk to skim milk or even low fat milk like that, you'll notice a pretty big amount of calorie difference and you'll be saving yourself that calorie difference. And if it's not substantial to you like it is to me, then, then why not make the switch, right? So that's an easy way you can swap out calories and save on that. And then you've got your pasta noodles, which are not just typical pasta noodles, they are whole wheat noodles. So if you can find whole wheat noodles, because remember I said whole wheat, it's gonna be the best because it's better for your heart, it's got more nutrients, it's got more fiber. So choose those whole grain options. If you can't find them, then that's okay, but try to incorporate it maybe some other way. And then we've got mozzarella cheese, which is a protein. And then um, the only other thing I wanted to point out in the recipe to give you an example is with the broth or stock, because that's a great opportunity to talk about the sodium. Because remember going back to that, we want to limit our sodium intake. And so a lot of times nowadays you will find broth or stock that is low sodium, reduced sodium. So it's not gonna be substantial change. And a lot of people complain that it's not gonna have enough flavor, but you can really make a lot of, add a lot of flavor when you go and add spices like herbs. Um, maybe you dehydrate your own herbs or you have some in the cabinet and really just experiment with that. There's the Mrs. Dash if you're really trying to watch your sodium, but otherwise you don't absolutely have to. A little bit of salt is okay. It's not, it's not bad. It actually enhances flavor, but when you start I didn't know a lot of salt and that's the only way you can get flavor then that kind of becomes an issue. Okay. And we're gonna go ahead and move on down. Potentially. And so I, like I said, I have, there's seven different recipes, but if you counted it, it would be eight because there is a meat sauce mix in here. And that's a great way to save you time in the kitchen. When you have, a recipe that you can create that will cover multiple recipes like a meat sauce that'll save you time and i know for this one i actually it they had to cut it in half because it originally made chili sloppy joes the sauce for the spaghetti and then the sauce for the cheesy easy cheesy pasta so you can save your time by just making a list of those items and that's the next thing i'm going to lead into after the recipes you will see this template where I have a filled out one. So if you were gonna follow this plan and you just wanted it, let me drop that down here. Oh, can't get this to work. Okay, I don't even know what to come on now. I apologize greatly right now. So anyway, I'm on this slide or this handout and basically what will save you time in the kitchen is when you can make a list. Because if you've ever gone to the grocery store, even if it's not freezing meal items, and you just start putting on your list, you know, what you need, what you need, you find yourself halfway across the store, and then you realize you've got to go back to grab that item. But that's why I have this really handy, which I did not create it. I got it from another extension um, handout. But it's a really handy list where it breaks it up into eight categories and that way you could just put down okay i need that from that recipe let's go ahead and move it over to that list and i do have a blank copy for this too so if you wanted to print it out and use it for yourself great that's why i did it but you'll see the canned and the packaged goods all your your shelf stable items and then moving over to staples those are simply your seasonings your flour and then fruits and vegetables self-explanatory as well as grains and cereals or bread and cereals you're just they're just your grains and then below that, you will see dairy, dairy foods, meat and poultry, as well as frozen foods. And if you know, 
since they don't have them. To the, those three that I just mentioned, there's an asterisk. And what that's just saying, and I have like the little blurb down there, is that these foods need to be purchased last to protect their safety and quality. And this is not only just for freezer foods. This is a good tip if you're going grocery shopping. You may think it's a little bit extensive, a little bit ridiculous, but microorganisms thrive in warm environments. And during this time of year, it's really warm out, so it won't take very long for those items to get warm. So you want to do your frozen foods, your cool foods, your meats that can really harbor that harmful bacteria towards the end of your grocery shopping trip. And then there's the freezer, freezing supplies, which are just, you know, items that you will need in order to efficiently, to efficiently um, package your food. And those can be, I'll get more into that later. I'll kind of show you some things. And then I have the templates. I don't know if you guys see that. I have the blank templates that you guys can feel free to print out and use. I hope you use them because I did work kind of hard. Not really that hard, but I did work on this. And <laughs> I'm kind of a perfectionist, but anyway. And then the last one is just kind of a highlight if you just wanted something to relate back to of, you know, what items are good to incorporate. And that's just your five food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, and dairy. Try to incorporate as much as you can for each meal. And then your, um, and then to limit, limit those items I mentioned already. And then if you'll see right here, I have a link. It's kind of long, but you can just Google it too. But this is something that I hope I find that I hope you guys find useful if you really want to figure out, you know, how much I should eat in a day, roughly how many calories. And for me personally, I don't count my calories, but this will give you an idea of how much, you know, servings of grains you should have a day because it's different for everybody. It depends on a lot of factors. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up for you guys. And so I'll walk you through it. Um, Taylor? Can you see it? Um, it says it's loading, but while it's loading, we've got uh, Christy C has a question. Okay, let me go ahead and see if I let me close out of this. Okay, what? Let me pull that up. Okay, where can we get the handout? Or, um, Christy, did you have another question? I'm going to unmute you. No, I did not. You were just, just that one. Up the handout. Yeah, just the handout is where I was wondering. Okay. Um, we will be emailing those out along with the survey links at the end. Thank you. Yeah, and I kind of had some last minute updates too. So it looks like oh, let's pull that one up. Not that one. And I, I do have a PDF, PDF of these slides too, so it's not just the hands up, handouts. But I'm going to jump back down and pull up that screen because I was worried that I posted it. And so this is just from Choose My Plate, which if you don't know much about it, it's just put out by the USDA. And what you can do when you go to that link and it's you, is you can create your My Plate plan. So if you're really curious to you know how much calories should I have in a day, well, this can basically compute it for you. So let's act like, let's put in just some numbers. 30. Let's do Mel. Let's say 180 pound Mel. Okay. Then we're going to calculate that. If it wants to do that. Oh, wait, here we go. We got to add in our height and weight. So this is where, where it varies. So everybody, like I said, is different and it depends on your age, your sex, how tall you are, as well as your physical activity level. For some reason I can't get this to work. Might just have to move on so I have enough time. Well, let's say he's five foot. Or six foot. Okay, I might not be able to get this sport to work and it probably looks ridiculous to you guys because it probably looks fine like I'm just clicking everywhere. Okay, let's say he's 5'7 and let's say he gets a moderate amount of physical activity. So more than 30 minutes a day, but not quite 
more than 60. And what it'll show you is it shows you 2,600 calories to achieve a healthy weight or 2,800 to maintain your current weight. So depending on what, where you sit, where, how you feel, <laughs> you click on that and it will pretty much just break down, you know, how many food groups of each, from each food group to so serving you should have a day, which is great. And so for him, it would be two and a half cups of fruit and then three and a half cups of vegetables and so on. And you can read more into this. I just kind of wanted to walk that through so it made a little bit more sense to you guys and maybe encourage you guys to go on there so you know. And it, it does break down, you know, what a serving size is equivalent to for bread. Like for bread, a serving is a slice of bread. I'm going to close out of this. Close all tabs. We're going to go back to that PowerPoint so we can get closer to moving towards the end. Okay. So now you should see packaging methods. So foods for your freezer must have the proper packaging materials to protect their flavor, their color, as well as moisture content and their nutritive value due to that dry climate that the freezer naturally has. So the selection of container really depends on the type of food that is frozen, as well as personal preference and types that are readily available. And foods that are in larger containers freeze too slowly and result in an unsatisfactory product. So you want to freeze items typically in a, in a smaller container unless you're able to get it cooled down fast enough. Because that's, I'll get into that, but it can become a food safety issue if it's a really big bowl of soup and you just throw it in the freezer. So you will want to choose moisture vapor resistant containers, which are those that are less likely to um, uh, cause the moisture of the air or to transfer between the two and really affect the quality. And cartons, I know they're not really as common nowadays, they're kind of hard to find, but cartons for cottage cheese, ice cream, and milk, to give you some idea, like your carton of your, your ice cream, aren't really great or suitable for long-term freezing. So think about like your ice cream that you buy from the store. If you have it in there more than a month, it usually has a lot of crystals in it because it's not the greatest pro or greatest container to really freeze it in long-term. You will also want to make sure that your packaging is durable as well as leak proof. And for me personally, I actually reuse my freezer bags until I notice there's a tear or a hole in it. And then you can also use a glass jar and I'll get into that in a minute. But you also want to make sure your packaging is resistant to oil, grease, as well as water, and that the right type of packaging for food um, protects it and it will really, um, it won't be as susceptible or likely to have um, off flavors or odors. And you want to make sure that you always have a packaging that's sealed properly as well as can withstand a label. Okay, moving on. Rigid containers make made of plastic and glass are especially good for liquid packs. So think of soup is just a great one to think of, or even in these pictures, they're a little bit like um, liquidy, got corn there you kind of see, or uh, some kind of tomato sauce. Although they are suitable for, um, for most packs, straight sides on ridges, rigid containers can make the frozen food much easier to get out, because think about it, when it falls out, you just pump it out. And rigid containers are often reusable and make for stacking of foods really easy. You, know, you can easily stack it, it looks nice and neat. Um, however, for jars, like your glass jars or mason jars, you can use those. They can withstand those extreme temperatures, whether you're canning or even whether you're freezing. However, if you're going to use glass jars, you want to use wide mouth glass jars. And I'll, I'll show you those in a little bit just so you, I can clarify, because if you use those that have smaller, the smaller uh, openings, then what can happen is if you fill it up too much and when it goes and thaws out and when it's thawing out, it, it won't have enough room to expand. And what happens a lot of times is it can actually just crack and shatter. And that would kind of ruin the day. So just think if you're gonna freeze in jars, do wide mouth jars. Um, some foods will need to be thawed completely before removal from the jar. And um, that way they can actually come out. So you can still use the, the regular shaped mouth jars if that's all you have. However, you really need to compensate for the head space, which I'll get into in the next slide. But, um, covers for rigid containers should fit tightly, going back to that rigid containers. If they don't, then you want to reinforce it with some sort of seal like freezer tape. And freezer tape, I know you can typically buy it at the store, but honestly, I find masking tape still works just as well. Um, but if you, there's always that option too. 
Okay, let's see, I'll make sure I'm on the right slide. So, bags and sheets of moisture vapor resistant materials and heavy duty aluminum foil are suitable for dry packaged vegetables as well as pretty much all your freezer mills. So, oh, I skipped over a slide. There we go. No, I didn't. I'm just making sure I can't see my slides anyway. Bags can also be used. So I'll get into that too, because I like to demonstrate and show people things too. But your freezer bags are just as great as if that's all you have. And you want to make sure that they are freezer bags, because if they're not, if they're just sandwich bags, or if they're just storage bags, then that can really affect that quality of the product that you've just frozen. You can also use freezer paper wrap. That's good for more of your meat. So if you're going to do pork loin, maybe you marinated it, you can wrap it in that and that will help protect it. And um, if you're going to use, if you're going to use foil, use a heavy duty, heavy duty foil, because if you use the cheap kind or one that's not heavy duty, then it can rip and therefore it can be exposed to those extreme temperatures and affect the quality. Okay, you want to cool all foods, your soups especially, because that's when we, unless they're doing like one like I'm doing, but you want to cool it before you go to refrigerate it. And I'll get to that when I hit the food safety, but when you freeze it within, or when you cool it within amount of time, then it actually helps retain the flavors as well as the natural color and textures of food. And you can pack all your foods into single servings, which is going back to the proportions. This will allow you, you know, to be more mindful of how you're preparing them. Like the recipe I'm doing tonight is only going to probably do like a quart of a bag, maybe two quarts. And that you want to make sure you are following directions for each individual food item to determine which can be packed dry and which need added liquid. And another thing, and it's in one of the recipes I provided, is there's this method where it's called tray packed, where you know, you think, I don't know if you guys have really ever made any freezer meals at home, but if you've ever made, like, I like to make breakfast burritos, if you make those and you don't let them freeze before you, you put them into a bag, or if you don't individually wrap them, you throw them all into a bag without letting them chill at first initially, then they stick together. So a good tip, if you're going to do something like burritos or even the hot pockets, the pizza pockets the recipe I provided you, is you do like a chill, like a tray chill. So you put them out on the tray, put them in there for about an hour or two, get them really cold. And then what you can do is you pull them back out, throw them into a freezer safe bag, and you don't even have to wrap them. So you save on wrapping because when, since you've already pre-froze it and they're not touching each other, then you know you can just easily pull, pull it out. Just think about like the freezer, freezer items you already buy at the grocery store. It's essentially doing that at home. So that's a good tip. And then talking about headspace. So, It wants to. There we go. All right, I think we're on the right one. So you want to pack foods tightly as you work towards the top of the container. And this is going back into headspace of like with the jar item that I mentioned. I'm kind of jumping around. And this is because if you don't compensate for that headspace, then it can cause things um, like your jars to potentially explode. Um, most, and there are like guidelines, but, but there are certain items and I have a list of them right here. You can see them. I think they're right there. That don't need that headspace. Those are things like uneven vegetables, fruits, like your broccoli, asparagus, strawberries, berries, your bony pieces of meat, your tray packed foods. So remember, I just talked about the tray packed foods with like burritos or whatever it is. Those don't need headspace and things like bread. I'm probably going back too much. Okay. Let's go back here. Let's find the right one. When food is packed in bags, you want to press the air out firmly from the bag. Get as much of that air out because that can make it more likely to having crystallization in there. And you want to begin at the top and press the food out. I mean, it makes sense anytime you let the air out of bags. And um, I touched on, you know, you want to use freezer, freezer uh, tape, but you can also use masking tape. It's a great option. And let me go ahead and jump over to the next slide. 
and then the last thing before I hit on a couple more things and then we'll wrap it up or get pretty close to wrapping it up is talking about labels. And this is something that I think a lot of us tend to not care about because we think, oh, I'll remember it. I have like a great memory, but I don't think, I think a lot more of us think that that can be actually do. I mean, I know I don't have a great memory. And what this can do is this can save you from throwing away food that is actually still good. And so it could save you, it could save you money. <laughs> So it sounds kind of silly, but it's really simple. So when you go to package your food, all it takes is it takes, you can use masking tape, put on there, and then use a Sharpie right on there, what it is and the date. And then of course, if you want to add any of the other following things, you know, if you want to be more detailed, that's totally fine. But I know in some of the recipes that I provided, it states to write what temperature to bake it at. So you don't have to go back and pull the recipe out, which is actually really handy. So if you just write down, you know, cook it at 350 after thawing it or just pull it out of the freezer and cook it. So if that's going to help you, then you can go ahead and add that. But just make sure to label it because I know what happened recently. I thought something that was in the freezer for like six months, but it was actually only in there for a couple months. And I'm glad I put the, the label on there because otherwise I would have just thrown it off. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the process, what it looks like when you go to create your freezer mills. And remember, I did provide you with a lot of, or seven different recipes and things that you can go gung-ho and have fun and do it all in one day. However, that's gonna be really exhausting. But I hope that these tips, these steps I'm gonna provide you with this process will help you, you know, get it down to where you're more efficient with your time in the kitchen. So step one is to cool food slightly at room temperature before refrigeration. And if you're in the kitchen cooking all day and you don't know a lot about food safety and you just throw it all in the freezer, and that food is hot and there's a lot of it in there, it can essentially create a hot box, which then raises the temperature of all the food in there, not just your food, but you know, think about it. Your, your freezer is set to zero degrees for Fahrenheit. And when you add in all that warm food and you raise the temperature significantly, it's really going to accelerate the, the shelf life of those items because it could be hot for hours if you put too much in there. So the biggest thing is that you need to make sure those items are cooled down when you go to freeze them. And a good way is that you can refrigerate them. But however, you don't want to overwhelm your refrigerator either. It's a little bit warmer, but you still don't want to overwhelm it. Um, I know I talked about the soup, or maybe I'll talk about soon, but there's different methods where you can cool items down fast. If you place them in a shallow container, so if you have like a big, think of a baking dish, a casserole dish, and it's a soup or whatever items, just let them cool out in the refrigerator for a little bit. But you don't want to be letting them cool out on their counter everywhere because then it can, of course, be more likely to um, harmful bacteria. And then moving on, step two is you want to cool foods to the refrigerator temperature before bagging them in your freezer. And it's okay to refrigerate, refrigerate foods while they're still warm. However, you don't want them to be hot. You want them to somewhat cool down a little right before you put them all in there, put it all in there. And you can loosely cover foods upon refrigeration to allow that heat to escape while it's in there. Step three is to pack foods into freezer bags. So use freezer bags, not storage bags. And I'll show you them, but there is a difference between them. They're, they're made up of different materials. And I know a lot of times, I mean, it's not it's not going to hurt you if you use a sandwich bag or a storage bag versus a freezer bag, but your quality of your food's really gonna suffer. It's not a safety issue, it's a quality issue. So if you really want to maximize the quality of your frozen food, use a freezer bag. And you can reuse them. Like I said, I reuse mine, but if it starts to get a hole, you, you wanna pay attention to those things and not use them because then it can be exposed to that cold air. What I like about freezer bags, especially if you're doing a lot of soups, is you can maximize your freezer space because like in this picture you just stack them and and you're using a lot of space just with that product you're not wasting it whereas if you use a lot of like bulky items then it'll take more space than what's needed however another thing is when you go to put those items in there going back to letting it cool down you don't want to throw five bags of soup on top of each other that are warm because it's going to make it stay a lot warmer in there for longer because all that heat is still in the middle of or in between those different products. Okay, step four, I hit on this already. Simply just remember to label your packages. It's gonna save you stress of knowing you know, how, long ago to, how long ago did I prepare this? Is it still good? It's more than likely still good, but you know, 
you, you get to get a better idea of what the quality is like when you label it as well stated. And labeling is just good for everybody because my husband one time wanted to throw something out because he didn't know what it was, but I think we knew. But that's the important thing about labeling is so you know what you're, what's right in front of you. And then the fifth step is to freeze the packages. So of course, we've got to move it from our refrigerator once it's cooled down enough and put it in those freezer packages. You can place the bag, fill bags on a flat surface in the freezer, just like with the storage bags. And um, so you don't want to let the bags, uh, stack the bags until they're frozen, and I already talked about that, or when they're cool, not necessarily frozen. And um, after food is frozen solid, you can remove the bags from the pan. So if you're doing that cool pack, like I said, with the burritos, going back to that, you can just throw them all in the bag and they should be fine. Step six, going into food safety, you want to make sure you thaw it out safely. I think a lot of us think it's okay to chill or to thaw foods out on the counter, but really this is a, this can be a pretty serious safe food safety issues, safety issue, excuse me. I know a lot of us can think, well, my grandparents did it, so and so. Well, yeah, but you know, think about the times that maybe someone got sick, but no one really tied it back to that. Because what what you what it does when you let it sit out on the counter is it's exposed to that that danger zone is what we call it, which is between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit, where microorganisms, bacteria can exponentially grow and really ca cause or create the potential of harmful bacteria simply from growing. So you don't want to thaw at room temperature. What you want to do ideally is if you have a plan and you have a good memory to thaw it out the night before. So put it in the refrigerator for the next day. Some of your recipes may say bake it straight or roast or whatever straight from the freezer. That's a really handy recipe because sometimes I forget. Set a timer if you think you're gonna forget. Or um, you, you can also do it if it's like in a baggie or a freezer bag. A good, another safe way to do it is either thaw it in the refrigerator, thaw it in the microwave, or to thaw it in the sink in a bowl of water, but you want that water to be cold. That's the key, you want it to be cold and then every about 30 minutes or so, you want to change out that water for about one to two hours, it should be pretty thawed by then. So those are your quick step ways, but you want, you want to remember not to put it just on the counter and let it thaw out. So hitting on a couple more food safety things is that food store constantly at zero degrees Fahrenheit, which realistically or ideally is your freezer, will always be safe. It only suffers in quality as time goes on. Uh, freeze, freezers, I, that's kind of a funky sentence, I messed up, but simply what happens when you put items in the freezer is that it's allowing those microbes and that food to go into a dormant stage, which simply means they kind of go into sleep. So it can't, you know, process or those micro, right, microbes can't move around or anything like that and cause it to um, ripen or whatever. So it can't go bad. So it kind of just goes dormant. And um, this prevents growth of microorganisms that cause both food spoilage and foodborne illnesses. So it stops that. And that's kind of, this picture I have here is kind of an interesting one and in what happens when you kind of blanch products, but it's removing those substrates and locking in the enzyme complex so it won't ripen anymore, essentially. And then the, I believe it's the last slide before I put my camera on. So food, a lot of food safety issues develop during thawing. And this is where it can be the, the difference between you know, someone getting sick or not, essentially. But once thawed microbes, uh, once the thawed microbes are, are there thawed, then they can again become active, multiplying under the right conditions and levels that can lead to a foodborne illness, since they will then grow at about the same rate as microorganisms on fresh food, like you just bought from the grocery store. You must handle thawed items as you would perishable items. So I know, I know you may think, well, it's been frozen, whatever, okay. Well, no, it can actually still harbor those same microorganisms, but once they come out of the freezer, they're not dormant anymore. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to my camera. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the differences between, uh, really quick, the freezer bags. Good tip is that with I know this is Ziploc, but with any kind of freezer bag, this is one from my home, and it's not Ziploc, Ziploc, is that the blue on the tops of the freezer bags indicates that it is a freezer bag, whereas a sandwich bag is uh, green, typically. And then if you actually look on the box, it states two, and on the pink is the storage. So remember, I said 
you can freeze items in your sandwich bags or your storage bags. So remember your quality is gonna suffer and it's not going to retain as much of those, um, that quality there, the nutrients there. And then you can also have or store your freezer items in containers like this. Um, they, a lot of them, you can even do it in your Pyrex glasses. I know they have the rubber top, but the Pyrex glasses are just as good to use. And then a good one, if you're gonna be having, a, or a good option is if you're gonna be having a lot of people over is you can use a throwaway freezer bin or foil bin. And I like to do this when I'm feeling lazy. However, I feel kind of guilty because you do end up throwing it away. And you can, of course, use a casserole dish to freeze items in. But remember, you wanna use heavy duty foil when you're going to cover those. And then touching on the, um, this is just freezer tape you can use or masking tape, whatever, in a Sharpie when you go to label, because you wanna remember to label. And then I wanted to show you the differences between the jars. So right here we have our wide mouth jar. And of course it's wide, so that's where it gets its name. And then we have our regular size jar where you notice there are these shoulders on it essentially. And what happens when you freeze items in this, especially liquid items, and you fill it all the way up to here, when you go to thaw it out, it doesn't have room to expand. And so that's what causes that breakage. So you can freeze in this, but if you're going to, I would allow at least fall below the shoulder so it has that room to expand. So you wanna be mindful of that if you're using regular shade. And you can also use pint size glasses. This is actually a half pint, but they look more straight, which is even better. Like the, there's still a little bit of shoulders on those wide mouth. And I wanted to do a quick little demonstration. If you have your handout, it's the recipe in your handout, the taco, it's the taco soup recipe. And it's actually been cut down into about thirds because since I'm not making a lot of food for anybody or just really nobody except me, that they're, um, it's all been cut down. So if you're following along, I'm gonna pull mine up to make sure I call this um, right. It's, the thing I like about this recipe is that it's just a dump, put it in the freezer, go. The only thing you really have to do is you have to brown your ground, ground beef. And you can use ground turkey. Ground turkey is a little bit lower in saturated fat, a little bit heart healthier. But I use 93% lean ground beef and I actually cooked it yesterday. And so it's been in the refrigerator and it's already cool. Don't even have to worry about it warming up my freezer or that I have to cool it down. And so I'm gonna go ahead and place this in my bowl. And in my bowl, I you do need some water. So I cut it down to about a three fourths a cup of water. So you're gonna mix it all together. And then I'm going to try my best to, I'm gonna add in my salt and pepper. And you don't, the thing with freezer meals is you don't have to add in all your seasonings at once because it does lose a little bit of its taste when you add in seasonings and then when you go to freeze it. So you don't even really need to season items. I mean, maybe if it's like an enchilada or something that has a lot of seasonings in it, but you can add in the seasonings later. You don't need to add it all in right there. And then it calls for a packet of ranch, which well, it calls for an ounce of ranch, and an ounce is a whole packet of ranch mix, but I'm just gonna do two teaspoons instead, or about a third. And then after you add that, you can add in, which also gives it more flavor, is your taco seasoning. And if you look on your taco seasoning, you, or look on this taco seasoning, it shows that it has 30% reduced sodium. And remember going back, we want to try to reduce our sodium intake because we typically get a lot. And there's still a lot of sodium in this. There's still 320 milligrams. And to give you an idea, uh, you should get about you know, 2000 milligrams of sodium in a day. And of course we're not gonna you know, eat this whole packet, but there's still a lot of sodium in there. And we're gonna do teaspoon, two teaspoons of this taco seasoning mix. And then we're gonna add in diced onions. I'm gonna add in a, a third of a cup. And I've already diced them yesterday. So that's the thing with freezer meals is that you could save yourself time. If you know this, this recipe has diced onions as well as this one, well, you can combine them and do it all at once instead of pulling out a dish and then having to do it every day. So um, put a little bit more in there. So you can maximize your time when you know what items need to be prepped and you can prep those items together. And then I'm gonna try my very best to attempt to do about a third of each of the canned food items. So I have some canned corn and I'll probably show you every one or just about one. This one says no salt added. 
Another great way to reduce your sodium intake, look for those muscle added items. And there is, I'm leaving the juice in it, but we're gonna pour a little bit out. And I'm gonna try my best to pour about a third in there. And then we're gonna move on down to the diced tomatoes. And this is also a no salt added. And remember, you might think that like you're losing that flavor because it's no salt added, but think about all the sodium, the salt that was added because of the taco seasoning, because of the ranch, because of the salt and the pepper. So you're saving yourself the, that when you're just cutting or choosing the no salt reduced so sodium added option or not added, reduced. And then before I cut myself, we're gonna add in a third of our diced tomatoes with green onions. And this one's just, it's, no, it's just regular sodium. Well, some items don't have the reduced sodium. So you're just gonna have to look. Sometimes you really have to like dig through the different um, parts of the aisle just to find them. Sometimes they're just more pain to find. And then the last thing I'm going to add, which is another one of those no salt added items is pinto beans. And it can be any kind of beans. It doesn't have to be pinto beans. Let me pull a little bit out. And if you can't find the reduced sodium options like at all, good tip is to rinse it in a colander. And so doing that can reduce up to 20% of the sodium in that product. And then you may question like, well, I need the juice, but you can just add in water and then you can add in flavor if you feel like you need a little bit more. But you don't always have to add in a lot of salt to give it flavor, like I said. Okay, so that's about a third. And then pretty much all you're gonna do is you're gonna mix it all together. And this is one that you would freeze it and when you go to prepare it, you can thaw it out in your refrigerator. I'm sure you can attempt to break it up into pieces, maybe do small pieces to fit into your crock pot. So when you wake up in the morning before you go to work or before you go to do something, you turn it on your crock pot, put it in there or your slow cooker, whatever it is, and then you can come back home and it should be pretty much ready to go. First, remember before you go, I feel like it's easier to do before, is to label your product. So I'm pretty simple. I just am going to put taco soup and the date, which I believe is the 16th. Yes, I am right. And I'm probably going to fill these up in two bags. These are quart size and they're the freezer bags. I'm going to get a ladle because that'll make life a little bit easier to put in there. And with freezer bags, you can really fill into the brim. You don't have to have a head space with it. No, freeze it. Yeah, freezer bags might be able to get quite a bit of it in there, not all. So you're going to simply add it in there. And if it's hot, if your ground beef is hot, it's good to do a, maybe the ground beef the day before if you can. If you can't, you can let it chill in the refrigerator for 30 minutes, an hour, see how much. It depends. Like with this recipe, it calls for three pounds of ground beef. And that's a lot of ground beef. So the more there is, the longer it's gonna to take to cool down. This wasn't very long at all, but I, like I said, I cooked it yesterday, so I don't have to worry about that. What do you know? I think I can fit it just about all in there. Maybe I might be ready. It'll be perfect. And you can clean it up too, so it's not it doesn't it doesn't come hard to to seal. You want to make sure it seals properly. And you remember when it's all cool and frozen, you can stack them on top of each other and really save space in your freezer when you do it that way. Alrighty, do you think that's about it? Finally made it through. Thank you, Taylor, for a wonderful program. Um, and uh, again, we hope you'll join us on um, July 14th um, when Taylor does smoothies. So, um, if you want to sign up for that one, you can go to betrolibrary.org backslash events. Thanks again, Taylor, for a great program. You're welcome. Thanks, guys, for coming.